joining us today. And welcome to Jonas Nursing and Veterans Healthcare's Vision Health Panel, focusing on vision health in nursing from research to practice. I am Dr. Althea Hicks, Grants and Programs Manager. I am Dr. Althea Hicks, Grants and Programs Manager. And, sorry. Okay. I am Dr. Althea Hicks, Grants and Programs Manager. And the, uh, we are at a program house at Columbia University School of Nursing, the signature program of Jonas Philanthropies. Our objectives today are to raise awareness of the current state of vision health in the field of nursing and to identify how healthcare for children and adults can be improved through research and assessments in vision health. We like to stay connected with our audience. So please be sure to follow us on social media and tag us on your posts with the hashtag Jonas Impact. Today we will be, we will be using the Zoom webinar platform, which allows you to submit questions for our presenters through the Q&A tab during each presentation. To kick things off, I am pleased to welcome John Jonas, Vice President of Jonas Philanthropies. John will share with us the significance of the Vision Health Program at Jonas Philanthropies and help set the stage for our event today. Welcome, John. Thank you, Althea. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Vision Health Panel, presented by Jonas Nursing and Veterans Healthcare. I'm John Jonas, Vice President of Jonas Philanthropies, and the head of our Vision Health program. Over 15 years ago, my father Donald and my late mother Barbara started to think strategically about the philanthropic footprint they wanted to leave on the world. In an effort to address the nursing shortage at the time, which was due to a faculty shortage at nursing schools across the country, my parents decided to focus their resources on addressing those critical issues related to nursing. For many years, Jonas Nursing and Veterans Healthcare has become a household name in the field of nursing. And we're enormously proud of our 1400 Jonas scholars to date, as well as our other nursing partnerships and programs. While JNVH is our signature program and still gets the largest share of our attention, over the last six to seven years, Jonas Philanthropies has further expanded our impact areas to now include also children's environmental health, climate health through reforestation and vision health. Having been diagnosed with late onset retinal dystrophy, my father understood firsthand the impacts of declining vision on quality of life and health and he began to focus some of his philanthropic efforts to making an impact there, especially to prevent kids from suffering vision loss. Today's presentation is significant because it calls attention to the extremely important and under-recognized connection between nursing and vision. I'm also excited that our panel today brings together for the first time, all three of the different programs currently defining our vision health initiatives at Jonas Philanthropies. Five years ago, Donald partnered with Dr. Jack Chaffee and Columbia University's Department of Ophthalmology to create Jonas Children's Vision Care, JCVC. This program led by a premier group of doctors and scientists has been doing great work addressing vision issues in children and families for five years now. JCVC's focus has been threefold. One, clinical care, treating kids and their families with basic or complex vision disorders. Two, implementing pioneering scientific research. And three, creating an exciting and groundbreaking genetics department, enabling early diagnosis of potentially treatable inherited eye diseases. 
I'll pause to let you digest a slide detailing some of JCBC's recent work. We're very pleased to have Dr. Shira Kresh, one of Columbia's star ophthalmic doctors on our panel today. A couple of years ago, we heard about Warby Parker's project. We heard about Pupils Project started by Warby Parker and we're very excited by their initiative of putting glasses on the faces of underserved youth. Last year, we became the first private foundation to support their latest work in New York City. We're very pleased that Jesse Sneath from Warby Parker is able to be here today and can share details with you about that program. Lastly, we've recently decided that at JNVH, as we recruit for our next cohort of approximately 80 Jonas Scholars, we want the focal areas of these scholars to largely mirror our four Jonas Philanthropies impact areas. So in September, in addition to having cohorts focusing on veterans health, environmental health, and mental health, we're excited that we will have seven to eight PhD DNP nursing scholars focused on vision and that their subject matter expert and mentor will be Dr. Pamela Caccioni, who's a panelist today. We'll also hear presentations today from two of our recent Jonas Vision Scholars. Thank you very much for joining us today. And we hope you will enjoy a rigorous and well-rounded presentation addressing the importance of vision health in nursing, as well as hearing about the other vision programs supported by Jonas Philanthropies. I also wanna thank Dr. Althea Hicks and the rest of the JNVH team, Mary Fiore, Maggie Gilwicks, and our executive director, Dr. Stephen Ferrara, for all their passion, commitment, excellence, and hard work in running JNVH and for pulling this great event together. I now turn the program back to Dr. Hicks, who will first introduce our Jonas Scholars, as well as the other presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. We certainly appreciate all of the efforts of Jonas Philanthropies in the area of vision health and nursing. Jonas Philanthropies has also supported research projects on vision health at the James J. Peters Veterans Affairs Medical Center in New York, which is where our next presenter manages her program. Belicia Philibert is a Jonas Scholar from our most recent cohort of 2018 to 2020. And she is the Resident Assessment Coordinator and Quality Assurance Specialist of the Quality Management Department. Ms. Philibert focuses on gerontology research with a focus on health aging. During her journey, Vision health has become an area of interest due to the increased risk of eye conditions associated with aging. Ms. Philibert's current focus is on peer support among veterans for vision health promotion. Please welcome Belicia Philibert. Thank you, Althea. Good afternoon and thank you again for joining this important topic on vision health. My name is Felicia Philbert. Thank you Althea for the wonderful introduction. And I am a current employee at the James J. Peter VA Medical Center. As Althea mentioned, my journey in vision health began in my role as a quality assurance specialist for our long-term care department. In this role is where my passions for geriatric and quality improvement grew. In the geriatric population, there's an increased risk of aging um, with conditions associated with vision loss, which includes um, impairments such as cataracts, diabetic retinopathy, and glaucoma. Glaucoma is also often referred to as the silent thief of vision because there is often no symptoms. 
These conditions can lead to vision loss if untreated. And I have unfortunately witnessed the negative impact of poor vision on health outcomes, leading to falls, isolation, depression, and an overall poor quality of life in this population. My interest in vision health grew more when we had a visit from a joint commission survey and the surveyor asked to visit our ophthalmology clinic. This is when I realized that there was no nurse in this important area of health. Although I have been to the ophthalmology clinic as a patient throughout my life, I never realized that there was no nurse in this important area of health. Um, this is where I found that um, by performing a gap analysis that patient education was one of the biggest missed opportunities in promoting vision health. And during the pandemic at our facility, we wanted to ensure that vision health remained a top priority in care and realized that isolation was a growing problem. So we decided to work on a peer support program for our vulnerable veterans to promote vision health. Now, peer support has been proven effective among veterans in the management of post-traumatic stress disorder, um, transitioning um, military personnel to civilian life, chronic pain management, and diabetes management. So we thought, why not try to incorporate it in vision health promotion? In collaboration with the ophthalmology clinic, volunteer services, and my department quality management, we decided to work on a process improvement project to focus on vision health promotion among our veterans. It was designed with input by veterans for veterans, and these veterans shared their experience with vision health, which in turn we hope will promote more vision health promotion activities amongst the veterans in this program. So the purpose of the Vision Health Peer Support Program is to pair veterans with a vision health related condition, seeking support and connection with other veterans with the same or similar condition. Volunteers provide support in a way of empathetic listening and communication with the veteran over the phone. The veteran volunteers share their lived experience with their My Life, My Story. They schedule and participate in telephone visits and convey support and concern for their fellow, fellow, fellow veteran. They listen, listen and provide compassionate care to their fellow veterans. The benefits of the peer support is a reciprocal relationship. The veterans receiving the support has a chance to benefit by promoting positive feelings that someone cares, increases coping, decreases a sense of loneliness and isolation, specifically with, with a hope to aid in promoting overall health and well-being. The volunteers providing the support who are in fact legally blind benefit from the program because it offers them engagement opportunities that they can do in the comfort of their home. The volunteers have verbalized that this program has given them a new purpose in life. The volunteers also have a chance to develop new skills, such as communication and organization skills, and to create new bonds with fellow veterans by using their unique experiences to promote vision health. So it's a win-win for the veterans on both sides, those receiving and those giving. In addition to the Vision Health Peer Support Program, we will begin to distribu distribute care packages with items that promote vision health, such as a visor to reduce glare and prevent eye damage from UV light, a foldable binocular to bring the world closer by magnifying objects at a distance. These foldables are generally convenient to carry, they're pocket size and lightweight. These binoculars can be used to magnify things for individuals with low vision to view objects such as street signs. In addition, educational brochures um, in large print will be provided with services offered at our facility, such as vision rehab. While speaking to veterans, many were not aware of vision rehab, which is a program offered to help them adapt to their disability to maintain a quality of life with as much independence as possible and safely. This program has distributed talking wristwatches to tell them the time and talking pill organizers to name a few. 
An acronym for vision that I share with nurses in my facility is that vision is important to the success in optimizing health outcomes and nurses can play a vital role in promoting all aspects of health, including vision health. In the areas where you do your work, some of the challenges you face while working with patients on managing various conditions can be very challenging. Now imagine trying to work with those same patients who now experience vision loss to manage their health conditions and outcomes. To simply promote health, vision is vital to health. Therefore, the biggest takeaway I would like for you to walk away with is a question to ask yourself. What can I do in my current area to promote vision health for my, the population I serve? It may be something as simple yet as powerful as asking them, when was your last eye exam? These simple yet powerful tools can have a lasting impact on the vision health of the population we all serve. Thank you. Thank you, Valicia, for a great presentation on the peer support group for veterans suffering from vision loss. I'm sure we've all gathered really valuable information. And our next presenter is also a Jonas Scholar alumni. Frankie Peterson Birch is a PhD candidate at the University of Pittsburgh School of Nursing. Her research is focused on genetic and environmental influences of age-related macular degeneration using blood-based biomarkers. In addition to her research interests, Frankie is passionate about incorporating genetics and ophthalmology into nursing education and translating science into plain language for the general public. Please welcome Frankie Peterson Birch. Thank you so much, Althea. That was such a great introduction. So I'm gonna share my screen here. I apologize. All right, so my presentation today is focused on microRNAs that are related to age-related macular degeneration. And just as a refresher, what is AMD? So AMD is one of the most common causes of visual loss in developed countries. And it's characterized by this loss of central vision that is stemming from the death and atrophy of tissues in the macula, which is in the light sensitive uh, tissue of the retina in the back of the eye. Um, all cases of AMD start out as dry with this atrophy, but in some cases it can, it can convert um, and actually create new blood vessels, um, which will kind of form, but then leak fluid, and that's called wet AMD. And we know that this is a condition that is um, kind of a, a case study in the, the interplay between biology and environment. Um, so we have these known risk factors like aging, female sex, smoking, European ancestry, body mass index, and genetics. And these are all very highly predictive, but they don't account for all susceptibility excuse me, susceptibility. And of particular interest of me is the genetics of AMD. And there are a lot of genes that will contribute to AMD risk, but two of the most influential are complement factor H, um, this, uh, this SNP here, the single nucleotide polymorphism, um, and also another gene called age-related maculopathy susceptibility 2. Um, and these statistical models that, that some statisticians have done um, have examined 13 common genes that we know are very highly influential and are able to predict which patients will progress to advanced AMD and to disability about 90% of the time after controlling for other demographic and behavioral and ocular factors. But what's frustrating from a nursing perspective is that this still leaves about 10% of patients who we can't explain their susceptibility to AMD based on their clinical data alone. So that would then beg the question, if these environmental and biological factors are being considered, what are we missing? Why are these 10% of people being missed? So another emerging contributor uh, to AMD might be microRNAs and the regulatory role in gene expression. And I understand that not everyone here has a, has a genetics background, so I'll try to keep this you know, at, a, at a pretty easy level. Um, so if you remember back to your, your sixth grade biology class, you have this messenger RNA 
that is then um, sends a message to produce a protein. These microRNAs will physically bind to that messenger RNA and will actually repress or degrade um, that messenger RNA. So that protein never gets produced. And this is a common regulatory mechanism. We know that about 60% of genes are controlled by microRNAs. And a single microRNA can contribute or can target multiple genes and multiple genes, um, or and a single gene can be targeted by multiple microRNAs. Um, so basically you could have the genetic risk for something, but not necessarily the outcome, which is really important whenever we're thinking about AMD risk. And we know that this microRNA dysregulation is linked to erratic gene expression, which makes sense on a, on a you know, uh, on a level, you know, a basic understanding level. But what's interesting about them is that they hold really great promise as biomarkers. And there have been other studies here that have looked at these blood-based biomarkers. Um, this one here by uh, Litwinska uh, found that there were dysregulations of 11 microRNAs that were highly differential in patients depending on what form of AMD they had. And some of these correlations um, were actually related to visual acuity. Uh, we have another study here from Blasiak that found that patients with AMD had lower levels of four microRNAs in their circulating serum and that they had functional implications. They were found to be involved in the regu uh, regulation of angiogenesis and cellular protection, protein clearance, things like that. Um, and this last study here found that there were associations with two microRNAs that were mirrored in both the vitreous humor and circulating plasma that could correctly distinguish neovascular AMD versus a non-retinal pathology almost 98% of the time. So this is a really exciting biomarker that we could harness. So my dissertation work is a case control study that considers not only the level of these circulating microRNAs, but also someone's baseline genetic susceptibility. And we prioritize patients based on these two variants that we talked about earlier, these CFH and, and ARMS2 variants that we know are highly influential. And then we use software to, to select microRNAs that we know interact with them. Um, so this may help to fill the gap between the genetic risk and these circulating microRNAs and could potentially lead to better prediction. Um, so future work would ex certainly expand upon the number of microRNAs and the number of genes and increase the diversity of our cohort to be able to generalize these results a lot more. And as nurses, we're always really concerned about disease prevention and treatment. So ultimately, these efforts add to a body of work that really may help us uh, better detect and manage AMD. Um, so the high degree of the testing accuracy combined with the decreased need for a specialized ocular examination at the screening level could allow more providers to assess for AMD as part of just a regular visit using a teaspoon of blood. And you might even be able to um, have this baseline level of susceptibility and track these results over time, uh, which ultimately we hope will help to improve health equity and consolidate clinical visits and extend years of visual preservation. So I have my references here in my funding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frankie. That was a great presentation and we appreciate you taking the time to provide an update on your current research and your work on age-related macular de degeneration. Now we will move on to our panel session. Today, we would like to introduce Dr. Steven Ferreira, who is our Interim Executive Director of Jonas Nursing and Veterans Healthcare and our moderator for today. Dr. Ferreira is a practicing nurse practitioner with over 20 years of clinical experience. He is Associate Dean of Clinical Affairs and Associate Professor at Columbia University's School of Nursing. He has clinical experience in college, correctional, retail, men's, and occupational health. Dr. Ferreira holds a passion for healthcare technology 
and integrating evidence-based practice into daily practice. He was awarded the American Association of Nurse Practitioners New York State Award for Clinical Excellence in June 2012 and was inducted as a fellow of the American Association of Nurse Practitioners in June 2013 and a fellow of the New York Academy of Medicine in 2015 and a fellow of the National Academies of Practice in June in 2018. He is the editor in chief of the Journal of Doctoral Nursing Practice and peer peer reviewed journal for DNP prepared nurses. We would also like to introduce to you our panelists for today. Our first panelist is Dr. Pamela Cashion. Dr. Cashion is the Ralston House Term Chair in Gerontological Nursing and Associate Professor of Geropsychiatric Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. Dr. Cashion is a clinical expert in adaptations for persons with vision and hearing impairment. She developed the nursing intervention, Individualized Sensory Enhancement for the Elderly, also known as IC. Following her National Institute of Nursing Research funded study, Nursing Interventions for Sensory Impaired Long-Term Care Elders, her research examines the efficacy of the IC intervention. Her intervention addresses the vision and hearing deficits of long-term care elders to improve their cognitive performance, mood, physical performance, and social engagement. She has received many awards and recognitions, including Alumni Merit Award from St. Louis University, Distinguished Educator in Gerontological Nursing Award from the National Hartford Center of Gerontological Nursing Excellence, and we're also glad to have Dr. Cashion join us as the subject matter expert in our upcoming cohort of Jonas Vision Health Scholars. And our second panelist for today is Dr. Shira Kresh. Dr. Kresh is a primary care optometrist who performs general eye exams, including complex refractions and multifocal contact lens fits, and who specializes in myopia control management and the non-surgical treatment and management of glaucoma. After obtaining her Bachelor of Science in Nutrition and Food Science from Wayne State University Honors College with a co-major in University Honors on a full presidential scholarship, she graduated from SUNY College of Optometry's dual ODMS program. She went on to complete her residency in primary care and ocular disease at the New York VA Harbor Healthcare System. Following residency, Dr. Kresh joined Columbia University Irving Medical Center, where she is currently an instructor of optometric sciences in ophthalmology. In addition to her clinical work, Dr. Kresh pursues research in the areas of early detection of glaucoma and technological advances in patient education. And she is one of our prominent clinicians at Jonas Children's Vision Care. Everyone, Please welcome Dr. Stephen Ferreira, Dr. Pamela Cashion, and Dr. Shira Kresh. Welcome all. Thank, Thank you. you for joining us today. Thank you, Althea, for that uh, great introduction. Uh, so I am. I have the pleasure of hosting this panel, and I just have some free-form questions I'm going to ask. Uh, I'll remind everyone that if you'd like to ask a question, use the Q&A box, and uh, we will... Uh, address those questions after this um, uh, after this panel. So thank you so much. So Dr. Cassione, I'm going to start with you. Uh, how would you describe <laughs> how would you describe the current state of vision uh, of vision health in nursing? I missed the first part because I was laughing oh. when you said that. Sorry. Go ahead. How would I describe okay. what in the vision you, the, the current state of vision health in nursing? Oh, great. So thank you for that. I, I really believe that there's many opportunities in the area of vision health and nursing. I think um, with the most recent data that shows that there's a decrease in life expectancy, increased morbidity, and as some of our previous speakers mentioned, the risk of falls and injury and um, one of the things that I see all the time in visually impaired people are medication errors because they can't distinguish medications properly. Um, 
that I think there's lots of opportunities for us as nurses. Um, when you think developmentally also, as far as you know, early on in childhood, identifying a visual impairment early so that we can make um, corrections to enhance their learning and development is gonna be really critical moving forward. And I, I just think that this is such an exciting area for nurses. They, they really, um, there's lots of opportunities here where we can make a huge difference. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Kresh, I'm curious as an optometrist, um, do you have any recommendations for uh, nurses uh, in the field of uh, visual health? Um, so first of all, I'll take the opportunity to say thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I learned a lot looking at, at the presentations that were already um, offered. So um, I'm excited about this program. Um, regarding your first question, um, nurses to me are, as were outlined already, just first line of defense. And um, in terms of, an, an op as an optometrist, partnership and collaboration are really the two big things that um, encompass a comprehensive eye exam to me, just because a comprehensive eye exam means assessment of their visual health, with, which oftentimes, um, is going to be, um, it has to involve nurses, pediatricians, primary care doctors, rheumatology, and all the different subspecialists. And really nurses are really that first line. So communication with them, partnership and collaboration is I think high up on the list. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question is gonna go to Dr. Caccion. Um, and uh, it is, why is exploring vision health important in caring for children, in adults, and in veterans? So it's a three-part question for you. So as we saw from our um, presentations, there's opportunities for nurses to look at vision impairment from the sense of, from the bench, doing genetics, doing you know more um, cell-based interventions or interest areas for research, as well as moving all the way forward to peer support and taking it to the community. So they, those two presentations were really a lovely um, pre, um, depiction of what nurses can do in the area of vision. And I totally um, support Dr. Koresh's comments on collaboration. This is something that we all need to work together on. and and optometrists and ophthalmologists are our allies in trying to help people with their vision health. So nurses early on in childhood and, and um, from birth forward identifying potential deficits in, in vision and trying to augment their vision and refer and doing a comprehensive, you know, a vision screen would be very um, appropriate either out in the community or in the doctor's office, wherever they're practicing in the acute care setting, wherever it is that they encounter patients is an opportunity to try and assess vision. And so we, we do that with older adults. We meet them where they are and, and try and assess their vision, trying to identify you know, field cuts in particular, deficits from uh, glaucoma or uh, diabetic retinopathy or hypertensive retinopathy or cataracts, what have you. Um, some of these diseases come on so slowly, older adults don't recognize them well and may have adapted somewhat to them. So doing these screenings is really critical for both veterans and adults um, across the lifespan, really to have an understanding of what's going on visually and how you can best interact with them, how you can support your teaching materials, um, adapt your teaching materials and your technologies to the, to the uh, patients so that they can um, see potentially or learn what they need to learn is gonna be really critical moving forward. Um, so I think really our job is particularly in screening. And then once we identify vision and hearing impairments, working in collaboration with um, optometrists and ophthalmologists, as well as adapting their environments, making sure they have adaptive equipment, working with low vision, um, specialists to make sure that they have the support they need in the community and can live full and rich lives and learn. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Kresh, um, I'm going to ask you, um, 
what are some of the best practices uh, for assessing patients' visual health? And I know you're an optometrist, so you're approaching this from a, from a different perspective, but are there any lessons that you've learned in your career that you could share with, with our audience? Uh, sure, I can, I can try. Um, you know, so my, my sister is a nurse practitioner and we actually collaborate all the time. She's in Michigan um, and I'm here, but she and I have been speaking about um, similar issues with patients for as long as I've been practicing. Um, and so I, I do have, a, um, I guess, a, a baseline understanding of, of what important questions and findings might be in a, in a nurse's assessment just from her and, and different things that she's come up with. Um, I would say, you know, for, for a general eye exam for, let's say a patient of mine, I look at it as a three-step process. Number one, to establish a baseline. Number two, to detect any kind of visual or related medical issues. And, um, and then number three is to provide them the care that they need for whatever those things are. And I explain to patients all the time that when it, when we see them, it's really about, um, detecting something, establishing a baseline so that we can see them for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, um, and often more if you're seeing children, um, just so that we have a really good baseline and then we can follow their issues um, over time. And the things that we find now, even if it's completely normal, we wanna preserve their vision for the rest of their life. Um, it's, you know, as a 40-year-old or 50-year-old may not be thinking about what his vision is gonna be like at the age of 85, but we are. And if someone has early signs of glaucoma at 50, Yes, it's a slowly progressive disease, but um, you know, as Dr. Cashion mentioned, in terms of life expectancy, that also comes into play about how long people are expected to live. But if you're expecting your patients to get to 80 or 90 years old, we have to preserve their vision. That's why with children, it becomes so, so, so important. With children, um, healthcare professionals, nurses are really first line of defense, um, pediatricians in the sense that they can detect something, they can get them for a baseline exam and we can find things very, very early. And oftentimes if they're detected before the age of six and their, their eyes are still what's going through what's called amitropization, um, which means that their eyes are still developing into adult eyes, we can intervene at that point and help them. Kids have a very hard time identifying and discussing visual issues because if it's how they've always seen they don't know how to, how to communicate that. So even kids who see double, which I, I see a lot of kids who have double vision. And when they come in, they think it's normal that they see two mommies, you know, they just, nobody asked them before. So um, communication, I, you know, that's gonna, I think come up in, in multiple questions, but in terms of, I'm like, I've gone on such a rant now. I don't know what the initial question was in terms of what a nurse can do, right? And, and, and identifying issues. Uh, number one is ask them for children and for adults, ask about vision issues, ask about glare, ask about double vision, ask about pain, ask if there's something. The second really important thing I would say is to ask them to cover each eye individually because you would be surprised how many diseases can manifest in one eye and it can be painless or there could be a high asymmetry. I just saw a patient last week who came in, who has NLP in one eye. She had painless, lo complete loss of her vision due to a presumed stroke in the eye. And she didn't have any other real symptoms. Her other eye was working fine. And she just came in because, you know, she was having some eye dryness and we, it was her first exam with us, but those things happen. And so um, being able to detect asymptomatic type things like that, that, that manifest in one eye by covering each eye and asking patients really um, uh, what's going on. One last thing I'll say before you move on to the next question is I always trust a parent's gut and maybe because I'm a mom, but when I have kids that come in and the mother or the father is kind of concerned about something going on, that's, that has to be listened to very, very carefully in my experience. I hope that I answered your question. You absolutely did. That was perfect. We were talking about best practices and You've definitely uh, shared pearls with us, and uh, they, they were great, great examples. So thank you for, for answering that. Uh, Dr. Cacione, uh, how can we help nurses create a toolbox, or what should be in their toolbox for, for patient care when we're talking about visual health? That's a great question. I think um, I would love all nurses to get familiar with how to use an ophthalmoscope. 
um, actually to how to how to actually even assess an eye, um, even just to check to see if there are obvious cataracts would be helpful. Um, and uh, tono pens are also helpful, trying to check for pressures um, depending on um, their level of expertise. We trained all our research nurses on how to check for um, eye pressures for glaucoma. Um, and that was really helpful. We worked with an optometrist to train us on how to do that. So that was really helpful. And I wanna echo um, Dr. Crush's point about the unilateral vision loss. Um, we had so many older adults with like really dense cataracts that had were completely unaware that one eye was blind. And so um, some of the things that are really critical to identify when we had our first patient in our study, her um, cataracts were removed. And um, I went back a couple of weeks later and I asked her how she was doing. She said, you know, I'm doing great. I can see color again. You know, these things that we do when we identify these issues have a huge impact on their quality of life. And so trying to really make a difference in people's lives, not just so that they can have, you know, live a healthy, fulfilled life, but to learn, you know, when you think about kids and reading and learning and, you know, seeing and staying safe, playing sports, these things, vision is really critical for a lot of these things. And having, how do we adapt them if we cannot correct the vision loss, then, then that's something we have to think about too, as far as quality of life for um, children and adults. Um, and these low vision clinics are really, really critical. I can remember another woman, we had cataracts removed and um, the administrator of the nursing home came up to me and said, you wouldn't believe how much she's eating. You know, we take for granted if we can't see our food, we aren't going to enjoy it as much. So there, you know, there are things that we don't even realize that are being missed and lost out on because we aren't addressing vision loss. And I've lost your question again, because I'm talking about something else, but toolkit, there we go. Um, so I usually make sure that I have a um, Sharpie marker that's in black. You want to make sure that you have um, something that is bold and have high contrast materials. You don't want to have something written in yellow on lavender paper. I mean, it's amazing to me. Um, and, and Times Roman or Arial print at least 14 to 16 font for people who are visually impaired. I usually have a lighted magnifier with me at all times that I can um, help them use, um, which is helpful. In our study, we gave away lighted magnifiers. Um, and if they had problems with glare, we would use the cataract type um, protective glasses for them. I have one story where the husband had um, problems with glare. The wife used to do um, handiwork, but couldn't do it because they were sitting in a dark room. Plus he was hearing impaired. So they weren't even talking to each other and they were sitting in a dark room. We gave her a task light and him protective glasses and it changed their world completely. So it's just really understanding what's gonna make a difference for that individual, knowing them and making changes of their environment as well as giving them adaptive equipment making referrals so that they can see the specialists that they need to see um, is really, really critical. Um, uh, you know, health is a team sport. We need everyone, all hands on deck. Um, and when you think about social determinants, I think we're gonna talk um, later about the school project and how that's making a difference for kids. Uh, it's just so rewarding. It just touches my heart. So I think we need to think about this more broadly and how we can help at a community level. Absolutely, thank you. Some great tips for a, a nursing toolbox there for vision health. Uh, Dr. Kresh, um, Dr. Cacione touched upon some of the issues uh, with, with children's uh, visual health. Uh, as a parent myself, I'm also curious, and you know, all, all of our children are spending more and more time on devices and screens. Uh, what, what could you say, or what tips can you offer uh, about the incredible amount of time we're spending on devices uh, at a very early age and and what concerns do you have for that? 
Um, yeah, that the device question is a big question. It's a good question and it's a very common question. I think I get asked that question probably more than anything else um, during the day. And I, I was recently able to do a, a program with the Jonas Group and that taught me a lot about blue light technology. And there's so much information out there, but there's a lot of it is misinformation and it's a big question. Um, let me see if I can break it down in a couple ways. Number one, devices come with a few issues. Screen time, right? So even just looking at the screen, that's an old issue because people have been looking at TV screens for a while and computer screens. And so kids have been, you know, um, that has been around for, um, for a few decades already for our kids. Um, the second issue is near work. Um, that now the issue is really not just the fact that there are devices on all the time, but the proximity that they are to our kids' eyes and to our eyes. So oftentimes we're holding our phones up here. If you sit on the subway and you, you know, you're looking at someone reading on their phone, it's really close up and our computers and our laptop, everything is kind of within 40 centimeters um, and often closer. So uh, the working distance is a second issue. And um, just the frequency of it is number three. So um, you have an inundation of screen time and there are certain questions about the health risks posed by screen time. Um, there's a lot of research going on with that in terms of blue light, um, in terms of contrast levels, in terms of um, damage to the retina and, and um, myopia. Um, so in order to deal with the issue of screens, that screens really has to be divided into the different categories of the risks that are imposed by screens. And the one that we can really manage right now is proximity to the devices. So trying to encourage a, an increased working distance, which means pushing the devices away um, to kind of decrease what's called computer vision syndrome, which is when the body tenses up, the eyes get locked on what you're reading, you decrease your blink rate, it's associated with lots of different headaches and eye strain and um, and dry eye. So by decreasing um, your, by increasing your working distance, so sitting further away, number two is managing the dry eye that comes with that. And then in terms of um, screen time itself, we don't really have a choice right now to say no screens for kids, right? Because Kids are on virtual schools. Hopefully that ends soon, hopefully, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, but kids are gonna be on devices. And so um, that you can consider getting different filters, different contrast sensitivity filters. Um, and there's also a, a rule that we like to throw around called the 20-20-20 rule, which is every 20 minutes, look 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And all the kids that I have been seeing since COVID has begun, I have literally asked their parents to set a timer on their phone and every 20 minutes, their kids, instead of being looking at the screen all day long, get up, walk around, look outside, take a breath of fresh air, sometimes put a preservative free artificial tear in just to kind of make their space not just about being up close. The biggest worry that I personally have with all the screen time is myopia, which is nearsightedness. Uh, myopia before COVID was on a massive rise. Um, by 2050, 50% uh, of the world is expected to be my myopic. Um, I believe I have that statistic right. And that is, that's an enormous number. In Asia, I think it's 80% of people there are already nearsighted. In the US, it's, it's lower than that, but we are on a, an international um, increase of nearsightedness such that the WHO listed it as one of their five um, health concerns. So that's a, that is a big question in terms of how to deal with early onset of nearsightedness and the progression of nearsightedness and how much the inundation of screen times and near work is going to play into that. What my personal recommendation would be is to establish care within um, an ophthalmic setting, um, preferably with some with um, a group that manages kids. Um, if you can find a myopia clinic, that would be great. We established one here in um, at the at the um, the Jonas Children's Group that we have on the Upper West Side. We see kids there. Um, but that's where we have a baseline myopia consultation. And we, there are certain treatments that we can do to slow down that, that progression. Um, that would be, I think that's my biggest concern. And 
we have to wait and see what happens with it. But there are thankfully things that we can do to slow that down. Thank you. Yeah, um, very concerning. And that's a great uh, tip for the 2020 rule. Uh, I would encourage everyone to, to practice that. Uh, Dr. Caccion, um, what can nurses do to educate and prevent, prevent vision loss among students through eye safety and early detection? It, it, that's an overlapping question, really, with what we just heard from Dr. Kresh, but specifically for the school nurse, uh, are there any tips there that you could share with us? Yeah, so I think protective eyewear during labs and things like that is really critical to protect eyes. Um, also during sports, if um, there are projectiles involved, um, and I think also um, texting and driving is a real um, issue for school nurses to address um, because of the concept of distracted driving and potential eye injuries from that that can occur, I think is really critical. Um, I would also just the school nurses play such a critical role in screening vision. Um, oftentimes people don't get screened until they get into the school system and the school nurse may be doing the screenings, um, which are often mandatory in school systems. So they may be picking up vision problems there and identifying and making referrals, which is really critical. I think we have um, as a country discounted the um, school nurses and we need to have more school nurses in schools to particularly in this day and age, there are so many opportunities for them and that's not the topic today, but I do wanna just put a plug in that I think that they're really critical for the development and health of students um, across the trajectory of school. So I wanna thank you for that opportunity. But I think really, again, just eye protection during labs in the school setting, you know, eye protection during sports, um, just like we try and prevent concussions and and dental injuries, we need to also prevent eye injuries. Um, lacrosse comes to mind as a big, big one that has potential association with um, eye injuries. So. Great, thank you. And Dr. Kresh, can you review uh, or just give an overview of uh, current guidelines for uh, visual screenings, uh, frequency uh, for different age ranges, and just you know again uh, any tips. Uh, for that, that we should be telling our patients and, and certainly also our family and friends. Uh, sure. Um, so backing off of Dr. Cachione, um, in terms of referring, even though there are these guidelines, um, I would, all, it's better to be refer happy than, than to not over refer. Over referring is wonderful for kids who need who need vision exams. And the worst case scenario, and the pediatricians have sent me kids and they said, I'm not really sure if they passed this vision screening or not. Um, you know, and let's say they didn't have anything, no big deal. But the kids who get caught, um, if you're not sure, that that's huge. So never be. Um, I think mean, you can always over refer for an eye exam. Um, in terms of this, is, there's a little bit of a difference of opinion in terms of when to start sending a child for a general eye exam as opposed to just having a screening done. Um, so I'm hesitant to, to say which one is more preferred, but I will tell you that there is an infancy program, it's called Infant C, um, S-E-E, -E, and they offer a free eye exam to children up until the age of one. If there were any visual concerns, there are practitioners who practice in an infancy program and they, they'll see the, the kid for free and dilate them and, and check their prescription and um, for, for patients who that the cost might be an issue if they don't have vision plans or, or whatever, that's a big deal. Um, in terms of pediatricians and nurses, I think once a year is, is pretty standard in terms of elementary schools. When I was going through my training, that was part of our training. We used to go and do vision screenings in schools that didn't have school nurses. Um, and what you pick up is tremendous at those vision screenings. So I would say always over refer, um, uh, yeah. And, and, I hope that I answered that question. Yeah, and and how about for adults? Uh, are there any general recommendations on how frequent uh, adults should be getting uh, vision screenings or vision exams? So the last that I saw in terms of the American Academy of Ophthalmology's recommendation is under the age of 45, you can stretch it to every two years. Um, and, over, and over the age of 40, that was under the age of 45 is every two years and over the age of 45, 
is every year, but I would use that as a, as a point just to say any patient that is being managed for, just as an example, my sister is a nurse practitioner and she's worked in rheumatology and she's worked in GI um, and a lot of autoimmune um, compromised patients um, have, they have to establish care with an eye care professional because there are things like chronic inflammation inside the eye, like a low grade uveitis that may not give them symptoms um, that can have very devastating um, eye effects over a long period of time. If, for example, um, cataracts, or if they're being on chronic steroids that can certainly lead to glaucoma. So anybody who's um, being managed for a disease, um, no question should be you know, established care with an eye care professional with communication between those groups. And let me back up a step diabetes, high blood pressure, those are the common ones, but then you get people with GERD and, and, um, and different, different types of thyroid diseases and, and autoimmune, but certainly anyone who's on a steroid or a biologic, any, anything that can have um, an impact in the body can impact the eyes as well. So I guess the screening is to detect something, but if you already know someone has a, a medical issue, then having a, an annual eye exam, and then you can leave it up to the discretion of the ophthalmology or optometry group that you're working with in terms of how often that patient needs to be seen. Um, but yeah, the, uh, that's how I would answer that question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cacchion, you mentioned that um, one of your patients uh, being able to see their food uh, increase their appetite uh, because they were they were able to to visualize and, and eat with their eyes, if you will. Um, what are some of other signs of vision impairment in patients that nurses have been able to pick up, or yourself have been able to pick up that we could um, you know tell others about? Yeah, so I think um, when I did our study, we actually did you know an ophthalmologist you know and um, used the ophthalmoscope to look in the eye. We also um, tested contrast sensitivity, near vision, distance vision. And so we actually did a pretty good assessment of how they were doing and then measured their, um, their pressures. So we had an understanding of what was present. So we would pick up quite a few things, a lot, mostly cataracts, um, but also some elevated pressures. We were concerned about how often they were actually getting their eye drops and things like that. The other thing in the long-term care setting, which is really critical, is that we labeled everybody's eyeglasses. One of the things that um, we would find when we would go into long-term care setting is we'd pull out a drawer and there would be 20 or 30 pairs of eyeglasses that nobody knew who they belonged to. So we would actually label them for the individuals. And so that was helpful. Um, but as far as what that impacts, you know, um, if someone was an avid reader and they couldn't read anymore, um, even if we gave them a mag, you know, a, a um, lighted magnifier, we would actually then get them talking books so that they could enjoy. We would try to adapt their environments. If they had trouble with contrast sensitivity, we would add contrast to fixtures. You know, environments, they try to make sure all the light switches look the same as the wall. I mean, just putting a red piece of tape by a light fixture so they can identify that it's new, that it's actually the light fixture that they can turn the light on there was really mm -hmm. helpful. And if they were blind in one eye, we would reorganize their bed so that people weren't approaching them from their blind side, which um, you know, in a long-term care setting where they're living there to be constantly startled by someone coming into your room is not a pleasant experience. But we need to think about that in the acute care setting as well if someone's either visually impaired on one side or hearing impaired on one side, you do not wanna be constantly approaching them on that side. You wanna set up the environment so that they can see you approaching or hear you approaching. So that's um, one of the things, just basic nursing care that we can think about to try and make sure that we are addressing this. Having high contrast plates and, and uh, placemats and you know, can help with eating as well. Um, and just uh, large print books, things like that, that we could provide to individuals to make their lives a little bit um, more rewarding was really um, particularly helpful. Someone who's constantly tripping or running into things, you might need to think about, are they, can they actually see? Um, mm -hmm. so with new bifocals, you need to be very careful with them and changing of, um, 
uh, levels, like steps are very complicated for people with new bifocals. You have to get really used to them. When you were talking about 45 and older, I'm thinking, ah, I started, you know, with my arms not long enough at 40. So I was thinking maybe we need to do this a little bit sooner. We're, we're all looking for our readers at that point. But um, so it's really kind of kind of interesting, these age related changes that occur. But I can remember one of the ophthalmologists I worked with in a nursing home once said that he could diagnose at least 50 different disorders just by looking at someone's eye, you know, the, you know, the retina. And so that's, that's really important that we think about, you know, it's a very vascular um, area and that we need to think about what's actually impacting that eye as well, that, you know, you're gonna see a lot of different things, but it's important. Great, thank you. So rewarding. I mean, when you can make a difference in someone's life and make them function at a higher level, it just, it brings such joy. Absolutely. And ch changes the quality of life uh, instant, instantly. So uh, Dr. Kress, would you add anything uh, to that? Any um, tips? Um, I, or... I, loved, I loved all of those tips. I thought that was really pertinent, really excellent. Um, couldn't have said them, them better. I just saw a man who came from overseas and he was, I think 42 or 43. And he just, he told me that he's old now and he cannot see, um, okay. because he can't read anymore. And he was absolutely shocked, you know, when I showed him what reading glasses would be. And he said, you got to be kidding. I can read 2020. <laughs> he had no idea that he was able. To, and it made me realize that we, education is just so important, especially in certain, in certain um, groups of people who really wouldn't know otherwise. They, you know, they didn't even, he didn't know that there was anything I could do to help him. He thought that he lost his vision, really. Um, just the, the wildest thing. That was a pretty dramatic example, but um, the labeling is such a great idea. Patients come in with, I've had patients come in and especially when I was at the, the VA, um, the VA that I worked at as a resident allowed each um, veteran to have a, um, a free pair of glasses every year. And I had patients that came in with a bag of glasses and they didn't know, you know, if it was their spouses, if it was their sons, if it was their, if it was theirs, um, cause they had so many glasses floating around and, and the other, so labeling them would have been a, a great suggestion. Um, and the other labeling is great for reading and distance for the exact example that you gave with bifocals. A lot of our elderly patients don't love having bifocals because either they're sitting and they're watching the TV Mm -hmm. or they want to play a game of, of um, Scrabble or something or, or read a book. So we'll generally split those into two to avoid any falling and mm -hmm. things like that. But if you don't label them, oftentimes these frames can look very, very similar to patients. Um, the other thing I would, I would say is colors. Colors can be very helpful, although there was a study published with glaucoma patients that they had difficulty identifying the colors of their tops after they've developed a certain level of cataract. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, colors do seem to, to help in terms of identifying different things. Um, the last thing I would say in terms of educational materials and Lighthouse, these are wonderful resources. And I think, you know, we can have a whole three hour session about how important education is in these patients. And the problem is, is nurses are very busy. We're busy and it's hard to have these long discussions with patients and their family members to really get, you know, um, good understanding of what the condition is. Having at your fingertips, um, educational um, Facebook groups, support groups, um, technology that's available to educate patients, websites that you like, um, and just putting that on a pamphlet and giving that to patients, not, you know, a pamphlet just about the condition, but something that they can click a link or share with their daughter or son. Or now that everyone's coming individually without their family members, this part has actually been tough. So I, I have my favorite websites that I will write down and say, give this to your daughter to discuss just so that we're all on the same page. Um, so that, that can be helpful. And the Lighthouse Vision Guild, which is also on the Upper West Side, right across from where the Jonas Care group is, is an amazing resource for patients. They can send agents to your home and get you a talking watch, a talking clock and increased lighting and uh, things that, you know, you wouldn't even expect to be around, but yeah. Yeah. It's so important. There were times when I couldn't even do vision testing in the nursing home because it was the lighting was so bad. You know, yeah. if you would bring in additional lighting and still couldn't correct it, we would want it between a certain range and, and just couldn't make it happen. So, you know, if it was I a clean, we were really in trouble. 
Wow. Um, so uh, I'm just going to remind you, I'll do, uh, we'll do uh, one more question each, and then we're going to go to the uh, Q&A box. So just prepping that. Uh, Dr. Cacione, uh, we talked a lot about, you know, uh, uh, vision in children and even in, in the uh, aging adult. Um, what can you talk about as far as uh, uh, vision disease or vision diseases? What, what, what do you believe are some of the emerging issues that are in, you know, uh, vi vision changes as not necessarily related to aging, but just, you know, in general? So I think with the um, increasing um, numbers of people developing diabetes, mm -hmm. that we are really in trouble. Um, vision wise, I think that we're going to see a lot of visual changes. And I think um, Dr. Kresh has already mentioned the whole concept of myopia just exploding because of screen time and things like that. But I, I, I am very worried about type two diabetes and the impact on vision. Um, the, you know, it's a chronic disease. And if it's poorly managed, the end and organ diseases affect the eye is greatly affected. And so diabetic retinopathy and those people need to be seen at least yearly, depending on the progression of their disease to make sure and probably followed by retina specialists over time, depending on the progression of their disease um, so that they can preserve as much vision as possible. And then, you know, um, Cataracts are still a, a problem and monitoring when cataracts need to be removed and identifying um, risk of driving difficulty, nighttime driving, things like that, glare issues. I think those are really important. You know, my, my focus is in the geriatric population, but I think, um, so I'm really the chronic diseases of hypertension, retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy, um, age-related macular degeneration, those are the ones that I'm most, and cataracts are the ones that I'm most familiar with, but I think that um, Dr. Kresh can probably tell you of some others that are much more common in younger adults. Um, and just if there's any question, refer. I mean, you know, we want to preserve vision. I mean, I, um, I can remember my colleague who was a neurosurgeon across um, in St. Louis, he had developed a implant for macular degeneration to preserve vision similar to a cochlear implant but really it was you know you could basically see shadows so it wasn't really at the point where it was going to make a huge difference in people's lives so we want to really preserve vision as much as possible um, throughout the lifespan you know so safety you know eye protection all of those things are really very important thank you Anything to add, Dr. Kresh, about vision disease, you know, diseases? I think that that's perfect. Oh, you can hear me, yeah? Um, yeah. You can hear me, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. I think in adults, absolutely. Diabetes is just an enormous one. I, I'd say I see a, a good number of diabetics daily. Um, it's a very tough disease. And it's in, in terms of the childhood component of that, Childhood obesity is a really, really tough one. I'm, I'm scared about what's the studies that are going to be coming out, you know, over the next few years because of what's COVID done to that. Forcing people to stay inside is obviously not great for, for, um, for our kids for multiple reasons, but one of them is obesity. Um, that can lead to, to diabetes very early on. So that's, um, that's a big one, I think, for diabetes is huge. Smoking is always going to be the second one. I think the chronic diseases are always, they're still prevalent. They're still um, huge and they still cause a lot of, a lot of eye issues. It's, it's not so much the diseases that are changing. It's, I think it's more about how we reach patients and explain and, and try to do our best of, of telling them um, how they should do things differently, which is, it's always a tough conversation to have. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, um, social determinants of health, you know, access and good nutrition are really going to play a role in vision health down the road. So I think we need to think a little broadly about how can we impact these. And I think the school program that we're going to hear about is, is one type of solution. So I think that that's phenomenal. Um, but I agree, obesity is a huge, going to be a huge issue. 
Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you both, Dr. Caccio and Dr. Crash, for, for participating in this panel, but you're not going anywhere yet because uh, <laughs> we are gonna open up the Q&A section. And I have a few questions here. Um, and now let me see, because these questions are not just specific for you all, but they are for, for, uh, for, for everyone else as well. Um, so Althea, are you still there? And if Yes, I'm here, Stephen. <laughs> all right, excellent. Um, so I'm gonna do the uh, Q&A and uh, you can stand by as well. Great, definitely. Okay, so first question and whoever wants to answer this can, can go for it. Uh, I would love to hear from any of the participants about ways in which nurses can take more of that active role in screening as first line of defense. What are some samples of screening questions nurses can be a part of asking patients examples of screening questions? So uh, can you offer any types of questions? So I think Dr. Kresh mentioned some about whether they see double whether they see glare, if they have trouble reading. Um, what I've found though is that history taking is really, really critical, but actually assessing their vision is, is important and each eye individually, as Dr. Kresh said, um, history is important, but I've found in older adults in particular, underreporting of both vision and hearing loss. Um, they, it comes on gradually, they get used to it, and so they may not um, report it as you would expect. Um, what is the best age for a baseline for children? And is there an age as an adult that certain important vision screenings should take place? We kind of covered that. Uh, does anyone have anything to add to that? The best age for a baseline for children? You know, I, I can't. I can't speak to the standard of this. I would just say, if, right. if it were if it were my kid, I had my kid seen by age one. <laughs> I think you, it's important to to pick up things early. You know, so um, discuss it with a pediatrician. See if there's any reason, especially if there's any family history of any kind of eye issue, especially with the developing myopia. Remember, you want to establish a really good baseline. Um, just to, to go back to that first one of, of um, questions to ask, something that I didn't mention, but I probably should have, um, is eye rubbing. Um, obviously, the questions are different for kids and adults, but eye rubbing is huge when there's, an eye, when there's a vision problem in a, in a child. Um, sometimes that can be um, picked up easily if the kid is constantly rubbing his eyes. Either it's because he can't see well, he's seeing double, very bad allergies, and if he's the kind of kid that has eczema or he or she, you know, is, is rubbing a lot, that can actually cause irregular astigmatism to develop. So those are, eye rubbing, I think, is a, is a really big one in kids. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Another question from Kira um, Baldonado. Uh, nurses can play a key role in driving policy changes for best practices at the program, state, and national level. Can you discuss the variety of ways nurses can engage in policy and practice improvement activities. Dr. Caccione, I'm going to ask you to take that one. Thank you for that. That's a great question. I think one of the things that we can do in our professional organizations is to work with um, Jonas Foundation. We can work with um, the Lighthouse. We can work with the um, Society for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And we have there is an American Society for um, Ophthalmological Registered Nurses um, to work with our um, legislatures to make sure that things um, are addressed if there's a public policy issue that is particularly pertinent. Um, for example, maybe covering uh, eyeglasses for school age children. For example, making sure that eye exams and eyeglasses are covered under Medicare was probably long overdue. Um, so things like that um, are really critical, making sure that um, school nurses are present in schools, uh, maybe um, an indirect way of addressing vision health as well. Um, you know, making sure that uh, appropriations, sometimes helping um, understanding what the issues are in your particular state or community um, oftentimes everything um, focusing on something local 
is a good place to start and then building upon that um, statewide and then um, national. But again, developing relationships with your um, representatives is key. Writing letters, meeting, going to um, different activities, voting, please vote. Um, things like that are all um, forms of our civic engagement as nurses. But being involved in our professional organizations is really particularly helpful. Great, thank you. And Dr. Crash, this question is for you. What was the name of the organization mentioned that provides support? I think you were referring to the Lighthouse Vision Guild. Is that correct? The one that would that provide? So. so there's the Lighthouse Vision Guild, which is really excellent. They can establish with you with an agent um, to go to a patient's home and, and kind of scout out what's um, what the needs are in the home. And they have resources for a lot of different things and submitting things to insurance that other places are not as familiar with the process. The other one is um, where I trained, SUNY College of Optometry, they have a, um, a great low vision clinic and they also have similar resources. Um, if, you, if you run into trouble with, with one, it's nice to have a second one. Um, those are the two that I'm most familiar with. Yeah. And outside of, of New York, um, the Society for the Blind and Visually Impaired also has um, local chapters and will be able to help. There's low vision clinics in a lot of the university settings that are really helpful in visual rehab. Another um, profession that we really haven't talked about that's also very involved in um, low vision in particular is your occupational therapist. So there are some OTs that really specialize in low vision and training people with low vision to ne negotiate their environment and to um, function occupationally. So it, that's another resource to think about as well. Um, Great, okay. Well, uh, I'm going to, uh, there were some more questions and we'll see if we can get those answered in, in follow-up, but uh, I just want to be cognizant of the time. And uh, again, thank you both for your expertise and insight into uh, this important topic. So uh, please join me in welcoming and, and actually thanking Dr. Cacione and Dr. Crash. Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun, a lot of good synergy. Thank you. It was a, a pleasure and an honor to be here. A lot of fun for me too. Great. Thank you all so much. That was a very good presentation. I'm sure we gained so much information. There were a lot of good gems in there about different things, the different topics all related to vision health, children, adults. And so I, we all took away a lot to digest. So thank you all so much for taking the time to um, participate in our panel session today. And so we'll move on to our next presentation which has been pre-recorded, And we are happy to have on our program doc, uh, today, Jesse Sneath, who leads social innovation at Warby Parker, a brand founded with a mission to inspire and impact the world with vision, purpose, and style. She leads the strategy for the company's social innovation and sustainability work and spearheads various impact initiatives and cross-sector partnerships, including scaling Warby Parker's Buy a Pair, Give a Pair program domestically and abroad. So everyone, please welcome this presentation by Jesse Sneath of Warby Parker. Jesse Sneath, I'm the Director of Social Innovation at Warby Parker. I'm so happy to be here today with all of you. Um, Many thanks, next slide please. Many thanks to um, Jonas Philanthropies for um, not only giving me the opportunity to speak to this incredible audience, but also for being um, such a powerful funder and thought partner for our school-based vision program. Um, without the help of folks like Jonas Philanthropies and Robin Hood and some other incredible partners, um, we couldn't um, really um, tackle this, this challenge of a vision impairment in a way that is um, efficient and sustainable. So um, again, big thanks to Jonas Philanthropy for, Philanthropies for their partnership in this work. Um, next slide, please. 
So um, as I mentioned, I work at Rory Parker. Rory Parker was founded um, just 11 years ago um, by four friends in business school um, with, with two big goals. One, to transform the optical industry, offer beautiful glasses, an amazing shopping experience at an affordable price, and also to use the power of business to be a force for good. Next slide, please. Um, when we think about using, using the power of business to be a force for good, we talk a lot about our stakeholder-centric business model. So when evaluating um, different opportunities, projects, um, partnerships, when problem solving, we really think about our five stakeholders, our customers, our employees, our community, our partners, and the environment. And we think about how those five buckets um, can help us um, have a positive impact on the world. Next slide, please. Um, but really the cornerstone of our impact work is, is our Buy a Pair, Give a Pair program. Um, we launched Worry Parker with our Buy a Pair, Give a Pair program. Um, and so for every pair of glasses we sell, we distribute a pair to somebody in need. Next slide, please. There are over 2.5 billion people around the world that need glasses but don't have access to them. And of these, 624 million cannot effectively learn or work due to the severity of their visual impairment. This is a real problem. We approach this problem with a sustainable solution the same way we would approach um, creating kind of other, other business solutions. So it's really part of who we are as our business and part of our DNA to, again, kind of be a force for good and um, help this um, challenge of, of visual vision impairment. Next slide, please. So to really address the problem of global vision impairment, we work with a handful of incredible partners worldwide to ensure that for every pair of glasses we sell, we distribute a pair to somebody in need. And really depending on our partners' programs and operations, as well as the ages of the vision care recipients, we work in two ways. So one, we um, are empowering adult men and women with the training opportunities to be, to administer basic eye exams and sell glasses at an affordable prices. So not only are we able to provide access to, to vision care in communities and geographies that have little access, but also helping to provide this livelihood for men and, men and women to become entrepreneurs to sell glasses. The other way we do um, our execute on our buy a pair, give a pair program is through our pupils project program. And here we, um, um, are directly giving vision care and glasses to school-aged children in classrooms where teachers and teachers and nurses are often first to spot uh, vision issues. And so today, I'm really will be focusing on the pupils project program of our buy a pair, give a pair program. Um, next slide, please. So to date, um, with our incredible partners, again, here in the States and, and abroad, we've been able to distribute over 8 million pairs of glasses in over 50 countries worldwide. Next slide, please. Um, as, as I know, most of the folks in this in the room today um, know that um, you know, vision health and vision impairment is a real challenge facing our kids. Um, the American Optometric Association estimates that 80% of childhood learning occurs through the eyes, and vision disability is the single prevalent disabling condition among children in the U.S., with low-income and minority students disproportionately affected by untreated visual impairments. So we started Pupils Project in 2015 to address this need by providing free school-based vision screenings, eye exams, and glasses directly to students. The feedback and the findings we got were, were pretty outstanding. So um, here are some kind of school specific feedback that we got um, that I wanted to, to share with all of you that were particularly powerful. So, you know, one, one eighth grader who had, um, you know, consistently be, been kind of reprimanded for, for misbehaving in, in class and kind of talking to his classmates. Um, once he once he got glasses, that that kind of his name kind of vanished from the poor behavior um, sheet that was hung in the um, classroom because he explained that he was talking to his 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 friends because he couldn't see the board and he he didn't want to tell his teacher because he was embarrassed and so um, that that was something that kind of particularly stood out for me. Another example is you know a sixth grader who was 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 particularly quiet and she seemed really disengaged and wouldn't even look up at the board and you know the teacher didn't really know what was going on and then after the vision test found out that she had um, a pretty severe 
um, vision impairment um, and had never had glasses. And, and um, you know, for her, getting glasses was pretty transformative. She could could kind of look up and understand what was going on. Um, and then another another example is two, two classrooms were um, composed of, of students that were performing four grades below their actual grade level. And in one of the classrooms, 10 out of the 11 students needed glasses and they didn't have them. And in the other one, nine out of the 12 um, needed glasses and didn't have them. And so um, looking at those percentages as compared to the rest of the student body, I mean, it's pretty significant. And, and, you know, I don't want to portray the fact that, you know, glasses are this kind of magical cure-all um, intervention, but, it, you know, it really, it really makes you wonder and, and think that, you know, if we're able to provide students the tools that they need to succeed once they're in the classroom, how, how transformative, you um, it really can be for a student's behavioral kind of social well-being as well as their um, economic potential or future economic potential and, and their current kind of academic performance. So again, anecdotal feedback from, from teachers, from nurses, from school administrators after this pilot was incredibly informative and kind of, um, you know, validated for us like, hey, we're, we're on to something here and this is definitely an intervention that can be pretty powerful. Next slide, please. Um, you know, another kind of key piece of this pilot was really to understand what were the current barriers facing kids from getting the care that they need. Um, so some some include kind of awareness. You know, as as you all know, vision problems are often asymptomatic. You know, kids kids get used to seeing things blurry and they don't know that they they shouldn't be blurry. Um, there's also kind of limited education around long-term effects of visual impairment, um, financial barriers. Um, you know, often the, the cost of eye exams and glasses can be, um, be too much, you know, or navigating public health insurance can be, can be daunting. Um, they're also the barrier of kind of conflicting commitment. So, you know, parents or guardians may may know their kids need glasses but they're they're focused on getting food on the table or getting their kids a, a coat for the winter or what have you so there's kind of a number of of kind of challenges facing these these families um also another barrier that that we know is like kind of intervention so getting glasses is a multi-step process there's the vision screen there's the eye exams there's the getting the glasses there was a actually wearing the glasses um, there's getting the new glasses if your glasses break or your prescription changes, you know, it's not just an immunization shot and you're done. And so, again, it requires additional support around the student from the parent, parent, guardian, from the nurses, from the teachers, from the school administrators, again, to really um, support the child in, 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 um, in wearing their glasses. And then another barrier that um, particularly struck out for, for Rory Parker as an eyewear company, um, we um, we really realized that fashion matters. You know, glasses are on your face. They're part of your self, self identity. It's a way you kind of express yourself. And so making sure that um, kids were getting the opportunity to wear glasses they were excited about was, was really important. Next slide, please. So again, through this pilot and as we started to kind of scope out the different pieces of, of this process, um, wanted to kind of spell out the different steps involved with providing kids care. So there's the vision screen, which is a kind of a basic visual acuity test to kind of understand like, you know, is there a vision um, issue here or not? Um, then there is the you know, the eye exam, um, where, um, again, looking at various different pieces of, of eye health, but often during this process a prescription is written. Um, then there's the piece of, of producing glasses, um, you know, designing the, the glasses and, you know, fabricating the prescription lenses. And then, of course, there's the dispensing of the glasses um, and the education and communication. So, again, ensuring that not only is the the kid that needs glasses getting the right prescription glasses, but again, how do we um, really look at all those stakeholders around um, the student to ensure that they understand when they're supposed to wear their glasses, that they are a glasses wearer, and kind of what that means. Um, next slide, please. So as we, again, kind of went through this pilot and these all these learnings, um, we we were really excited by the by the opportunity um, because the need was 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 there. Um, so here we really kind of were able to kind of formalize our pupils project program where um, we 
who are committed to providing prescription glasses to all kids in need throughout the country at no cost to families. And we believe that this ambitious yet achievable goal can be reached through dynamic partnership between the private and public sector. And I think a really big takeaway from our pilots were, um, you know, providing glasses that kids were excited about um, is really one piece of the puzzle when building um, a successful and scalable um, school-based vision program. There are so many other key partners and um, 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 kind of sectors that are important and kind of working to together to bring, um, to ensure all kids who need glasses get them. Um, and so next slide, please. Um, Fast forward a little over five years later, we've expanded the program since that initial pilot. In New York, we work with incredible partners like the Jonas, Jonas Philanthropies, um, Robin Hood, City of New York, the Department of Ed, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, um, Helen Keller International, to name a few. Um, we um, expanded in Baltimore, working with the city the Baltimore City Health Department, the Baltimore City Schools, Johns Hopkins University, um, and then in Philadelphia, working with the Vision to Learn um, team, which is an organization based out of LA who provides optometric care, as well as the Eagles Charitable Foundation. And I think what makes me so excited about this work is, again, um, problem solving with um, through cross-sector partnership has has been so so powerful and energizing when thinking about um, solving a problem like vision impairment. Um, and since since launching the program about five five years ago, we've been able to provide over a hundred thousand pairs of glasses to students in need. So, in thinking about kind of the timeline of this program to date, so in 2015 we launched with this pilot um, at the lab school. From there, we um, again kind of understood where was Worry Parker's value add. We were we were good at providing the free prescription glasses that kids were excited to wear. But when thinking about um, connecting with um, all these different schools within New York, um, providing the, the vision services such as the eye exams and the, the vision screenings, connecting with other partners was, was critical, critical to our success. So we started working with the strategic um, office within the mayor's the mayor's team, we also work with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, as well as the Department Ed. Um, and so we were able to launch Pupils Project working with within 150 high need schools, um, pre-K through 12th grade, um, where the city was really coming in, providing the free vision screenings and eye exams, um, leveraging infrastructure that they already had in place, but again, just expanding it to reach more kids. Um, and that piece of this program is funded by taxpayer money. And then Warry Parker is coming in by um, providing the free prescription glasses that our team has designed, a beautiful assortment, providing optionality and choice when it comes to glasses, again, is something that really resonates with us as an eyewear brand. And so we wanted to make sure we were we were offering an assortment that kids were excited about. Um, since then, we've expanded our community school programs, reaching 260 schools within, within New York. Um, again, leveraging a bunch of incredible government agencies and, and other partners to do this work. And then more recently, um, being able to continue our community school program, but with, with the support and partnership of Jonas Philanthropies, being able to expand this work um, to all kindergartners and first graders um, within New York City um, to provide vision screens, eye exams, and glasses at no cost to families. And so we, um, again, continue to be just so inspired and, and grateful for the partnership of Jonas Philanthropies that um, you know really really prioritize um, innovation and um, understanding the efficacy of this work and knowing how transformative glasses can be. Um, they've been such an, an amazing partner and has been you know really a model that we look to when thinking about expanding across the country to other cities. Um, so as I mentioned, we're in Baltimore and Philadelphia. We're actively um, talking to other government agencies and partners throughout the country. Um, there are over 2 million kids across the country that need glasses and don't have them. And so when thinking about expansion, we look to this, this, this kind of program and model that we helped kind of 
partner uh, work with with Jonas Philanthropies on um, to to kind of replicate in in cities across the country. So um, next slide, please. Just want to thank thank you all for letting me be here today and and sharing a bit about um, our work. Um, and I'm excited to. Um, maybe join next year and give you another update kind of post post covid um as you as you all can imagine covid has um has impacted our program um this year but um we're we're incredibly grateful that everybody's kind of tracking towards this fall to get things um kind of back up and running um so excited to bring you guys all an exciting update in um next year thank you Great. We truly thank Jesse for presenting that presentation on the program at Warby Parker and sharing all those details about the Pupils Project. And we'd really like to remind everyone to please remember to follow us on social media and tag us on your posts with the hashtag Jonas Impact. So at this point, we're, we're at the end of our program. And again, we want to give a special thank you to all of you who were able to join us today. We truly appreciate the time that everyone took for our presenters, all of, one, all of you who participated in today's discussion, our presenters, our speakers, our panel presenters. We hope this information has been valuable to you and that you continue to think about the significance of vision health in nursing. We are sure you've gained some practical knowledge as well as valuable tools provided by all of our healthcare experts. And so we also want to thank our presenters for their time and their expertise, which in, it has truly been a pleasure having them with us today. And of course, we want to thank the Jonas family and Jonas Philanthropies for their continuous support and vision for investing in nursing education and the important health matters across all populations. We hope everyone will continue to stay safe and stay well and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for joining us.